The rest of our conversation today takes us into the world of situational or contingency approaches to leadership. These approaches tackle many of the challenges posed by trait and behavioral perspectives by recognizing that different leadership styles are like different tools in a toolbox. They're more useful in some situations than others. Plus, these approaches zoom out a bit and consider not only the leader, but also the followers. We'll start by unpacking three early theories from this approach. One, Fiedler's contingency theory, also known as cognitive resource theory. Two, Houses path goal theory. And three, Hersey and Blanchard's situational leadership theory. Fiedler's model assumes that effective leadership depends on a match between a leader's style and the situation. It's related to the idea of person-environment fit that we talked about in the lecture on stress. In this model, there are three crucial situational factors. The first is leader-member relations. How much do followers trust the leader? The second, task structure, the structure inherent in the job. And the third, positional power, or the leader's authority. Imagine a restaurant manager who needs to coordinate chefs, waitstaff, and other employees. The leadership situation, as Fiedler sees it, is dictated by these three ingredients, leader-member relations, task structure, and positional power. Now picture this. The staff respect the manager, so leader-member relations are strong. The roles of everyone in the kitchen and on the floor are clear, so task structure is solid. And the manager has the final say in decisions, including hiring, firing, and rewarding employees. So positional power is firm. This situation is most favorable for the leader. On the flip side, if there are weak leader-member relations, loose task structure, and low positional power, the situation is unfavorable. So in this restaurant scenario, according to this model, a manager who's more focused on getting orders out promptly, so task-oriented, would shine in either of these situations. Why? Well, in both scenarios, whether things are running smoothly or running poorly, you just need someone who can ensure the kitchen keeps running. But what if the situation is in between? Maybe you have one or two of those situational factors in place, but not all three. That's when a manager who prioritizes team harmony and morale, so they're relationship oriented, can make the difference. Here, they can enhance the situation by strengthening interpersonal bonds and boosting motivation. That's the gist of Fiedler's theory. And there's some support for the notion that the leadership style that's most effective depends on how favorable the situation. But there's also some limitations. This theory makes a significant assumption that has raised eyebrows. It assumes that if you're a task-focused leader, you're always going to be a task-focused leader. And if you're a relationship-oriented leader, you're always going to be a relationship-oriented leader, no matter what. This implies that when a situation calls for a different leadership style, you'll need a completely new leader instead of adapting your current one. Additionally, measuring the three contingency factors we mentioned earlier, leader-member relations, task structure, and positional power, is not always easy. So while Fiedler's theory does give us some interesting things to ponder, it's not without its limitations. Next, we'll look at the path goal theory. The focus of this theory is on the leader as a facilitator. So how can the leader help the follower achieve their goals? This theory highlights a variety of leadership behaviors, much like the other theories. But there's a little twist. It doesn't limit leaders to one specific style. Instead, it argues leaders should be like a Swiss army knife, ready with a suitable tool, or in this case, behavior, for every scenario. Okay, let's imagine that you're managing a bustling restaurant. You're responsible for a team of waitstaff, chef, bartenders, and dishwashers, and you want to keep the restaurant running smoothly while maintaining a harmonious atmosphere. You find that different leadership styles can help you to effectively manage your diverse team. Firstly, we have supportive leadership. This maps onto the relationship focus. It involves showing a concern for your followers, being open, friendly, and approachable. As a restaurant manager, this means you're not just giving orders from your office, but are out on the floor asking your staff how they're doing and offering your help when they're overwhelmed. This style is most appropriate when the team are stuck with repetitive and less appealing tasks, say peeling kilos of potatoes or cleaning up at the end of the day. Their encouragement makes mundane tasks bearable. Next, you've got your directive leadership. Here you tell the followers exactly what they're supposed to do. You're setting the roster, outlining daily specials, directing the flow during busy times, giving instructions to make sure everything runs smoothly. A directive style shines when tasks are ambiguous or when employees are less independent. 
Let's say you suddenly receive an enormous party booking for a gourmet multi-course meal that your team has never prepared before. This challenge is quite ambiguous. The exact details of the dishes, the arrangement of the courses, and the presentation style are all undefined. In such a scenario, the directive leadership style is needed to handle the complexity. But sometimes you change your approach and adopt a participative style. Instead of telling the employees what to do, you enable them to choose their own direction and to have a say. You might get your team together and ask for their input on the new menu or seek their opinions on how to improve service. You're giving them ownership, allowing them to contribute to decision making, which can lead to increased job satisfaction and engagement. The participative style is particularly appropriate when dealing with issues that are highly relevant to employees. Let's say there are decisions to be made about the upcoming holiday roster or the restaurant's new set of goals. These are topics close to the team's heart. A participative style is useful here because it ensures you have everyone's input. Finally, there's the achievement-oriented leadership style. Here, the focus is on high-quality performance, setting clear and challenging goals, and rewarding employees when those goals are achieved. So you set high standards for your team, challenging them to step up their game. Maybe you set a goal to win a coveted culinary award or to become the number one restaurant in the city. This style is most useful when your employees themselves are achievement oriented or when they're highly independent. What's unique about path goal theory is its flexibility. It recognizes that situations may call for different leadership behaviors. Rather than being rigid, it encourages leaders to adapt and modify their behavior as per the demands of the situation. Let's shift focus now to situational leadership theory. Situational leadership theory is one of the first theories to consider the role of followers in more detail. So the idea being that leadership is not just about the leader themselves or about the situation, but it's also about the people who they are leading. The idea is that some followers are more ready. They're more willing and able, and these followers may need less support. A skilled leader, like a wise head chef, tailors their approach to each team member. If a team member's readiness is low, maybe they're fresh out of culinary school, they might need more guidance. The leader steps in, showing them the ropes and providing support. But if a chef's already a pro, the leader steps back and lets the expert do their thing. So according to situational leadership theory, effective leaders are able to read the room and adjust their style to meet their team's abilities, ensuring everyone has the right level of support to succeed. This again highlights this theme of there not being a one-size-fits-all approach to leadership. It's about customizing your style to help your team whip up their best work. Let's segue into the critique of these situational and contingency theories. The argument that leadership style should depend on the situation certainly has merit. But some have argued that the situational factors are difficult to define. You know it's there, but it's hard to accurately measure or shape. Some critics say these theories have a similar issue to the trade approach. They're looking through a keyhole instead of opening the door. The trade approach fixates on the individual traits. The situational approach zeroes in on the environment. But wouldn't it be more useful if we could see the whole picture, how traits and situations interact? That's where modern leadership theories come into play. They recognize that effective leadership depends on a blend of personal traits and situational context. It's not just about one or the other. It's about how they come together. So now we'll discuss four contemporary theories that are all the rage in the field of leadership. The first is leader member exchange theory. It's all about the quality of the relationship between the leader and each individual member of the team. The next is the social identity theory approach to leadership. Here, leadership success hinges on how well leaders can cultivate a strong sense of group identity and cohesion. The third is charismatic leadership theory. This theory looks at leaders who possess that certain je ne sais quoi, an enigmatic charm that inspires and motivates others. And then the full range leadership model or transformational leadership theory. This theory centers on how leaders can ignite significant change and inspire their team to reach new heights. Leader member exchange theory or LMX as some people call it, brings relationships to the center stage. It highlights the intriguing truth that leaders don't treat everyone in their squad equally. Let's imagine you're a cafe manager. You've got Gabrielle, who is super competent and her latte art is out of this world. Naturally, you appreciate Gabrielle and form a high quality bond with her. She's in your A team, or in more theoretical terms, your in group. This relationship comes with perks, more responsibility, exciting opportunities, 
and an overall higher job satisfaction for Gabrielle. On the flip side, you've got Tom, who's perpetually late and his lattes are just okay. You end up having a lower quality relationship with Tom. He becomes part of the outgroup, where responsibilities are fewer, tasks are more routine, and sadly, job satisfaction takes a dip. It's fascinating how the leader-follower relationship can impact an organization. Numerous studies suggest that the higher the quality of this bond, the more satisfied and committed an employee becomes, which translates into better performance. But let's dissect this a bit further, shall we? Take the concept of leader-member exchange and think of it as having two key ingredients. One is leader-member exchange quality. This refers to the overall manner in which leaders interact with their team members. Two is LMX differentiation. This looks at the disparity between how leaders treat their in-group and out-group followers. This should ring a bell. Remember our chat about team personality and its two elements, elevation and diversity. Well, it's kind of similar here. Perhaps unsurprisingly, research has found that LMX quality positively affects performance because it boosts role engagement. So the better your boss treats you, the more engaged you are and the better you perform. However, leader member exchange differentiation is where things get a bit trickier. The research shows that when a leader treats certain team members much better than others, it negatively affects the team's performance. While you might enjoy being your boss's favorite employee, this favoritism can disturb the team's ability to coordinate effectively. So what's the golden rule here? Ideally, a leader should strive to maintain high quality relationships with everyone on the team, ensuring that everyone feels valued and respected. While there's plenty of evidence backing up the importance of leader member exchange, it's not without its criticisms. Some argue that it's often tough to apply these concepts in real life situations. For instance, it's not always feasible to maintain a high quality relationship with your supervisor. Circumstances may not allow it, or personalities might clash. Moreover, the implicit categorization of team members into in-groups and out-groups can be problematic, as it's frequently based on inherent biases such as gender or age. Overcoming these biases is easier said than done. Because of these challenges, the leader-member exchange theory, despite its descriptive power, has found limited application in the real world compared to some other theories we'll be exploring soon. Nonetheless, it's had a lot of influence in the field because it provides valuable insights into the dynamics between leaders and their team members. And this makes it an essential part of our understanding of effective leadership. You may already be familiar with social identity theory from other courses. It's a powerful framework based on the idea that we define ourselves by the groups we belong to, our social identity, and our individual selves, our personal identity. People naturally gravitate towards a positive self-concept and like to see themselves in a favorable light. One way we foster this positive self-concept is by seeing our in-groups, the groups we're a part of, as positive and distinct from out-groups, the ones we don't belong to. Importantly, this self-definition is flexible. It can evolve over time. Now let's apply this to leadership. The social identity approach to leadership posits that effective leaders embody the identity shared among their team members. They are, in essence, the archetype of the group, exemplifying what it means to be a valuable member. When leaders embody this shared identity, people are more likely to follow them. If a leader fails to be a fitting representation of the group, followership might dwindle. So the key to successful leadership according to this approach is managing this identification process. It's about leaders investing time and energy into creating, representing, or nurturing this shared sense of us. According to social identity theory, there are four key elements of leadership. First off, we have creating a sense of us, also known as identity entrepreneurship. This is about identifying and cultivating the unique shared identity within your group or organization. Imagine a cafe manager figuring out what bonds their baristas together. Is it their shared passion for the art of coffee making or a collective commitment to providing excellent customer service? Next, we have being one of us, representing us, which we refer to as identity prototypicality. This aspect is all about exemplifying and embodying the group identity. Think of the cafe manager who consistently demonstrates the dedication, creativity, and friendliness that defines their team, serving as a model for what it means to be part of that team. Following that, we have advancing us, or identity advancement. 
This step involves championing the shared identity to others in the organization. In our cafe example, consider the manager proudly promoting the unique ethos or coffee making style of the baristas to the cafe's owner or customers. Finally, there's making us matter, also known as identity empresarioship. This involves integrating the group's identity within the wider organization and ensuring it's recognized and valued. It's akin to the cafe manager, ensuring that the cafe's overall brand and ambiance reflect the unique identity and style of the barista team. So while the concept of social identity theory itself is not new, applying it to leadership is a relatively fresh perspective. One significant contribution of this theory is its focus on followers and their social identification process, which lays the groundwork for trusting their leader. Now, you might wonder, what additional insights does the social identity approach offer compared to the leader member exchange perspective? There's research indicating that it does bring something extra to the table. While the leader member exchange perspective centers on the quality of individual relationships between the leader and followers, social identity theory expands on this focus. It delves into the leader's identification with the group as a whole and their role in promoting the group's interests. Suppose we're in the cafe scenario again. It's not just about the cafe manager having a good rapport with each barista. It's about the manager identifying with the team, working towards a shared vision of serving the best coffee, and promoting this vision within and outside the cafe. That's the extra layer social identity theory brings to the conversation. One significant advantage of the social identity approach is that it provides clear, practical guidelines for leaders looking to manage their identities effectively. And we'll talk a bit more about the practical side of this theory towards the end of the video.